Let us pray. Dear Jesus, help us to not be troubled. Help us to believe in the triune God and in you. Help us to do your work in our present moment. Thank you for preparing a place for us in your Father's house. In your most holy and precious name, amen. Okay, go in peace. Sermon's over. Just kidding. I feel like I could stop there. But if you're like me this week, it's been hard to feel like your head was ever above water. I've been troubled. I've been reading too much news. I've been watching Facebook too much. This week we've seen an explosion of conspiracy theories that sow seeds of doubt and regarding those we need to be able to trust. We began our first phase of the North Carolina reopening plan. Murder hornets. Our mayor was interviewed on North Carolina NPR, mostly because of the optics of a city council who writes legislation for a $500 a month pay raise during a global pandemic. And I found more than one element of her interview troubling. I got so spooled up that I submitted a letter to the editor of my uh, local neighborhood children's created newspaper. Probably when I should have been doing other things, my poor wife. And this horrific story in Georgia of Ahmed Arbery that reinforces the tragedy of our human brokenness. The implications of this story are horrifying on the, the grand level, the macro level, but also absolutely heart-wrenching to consider for the family who lost a son and a brother. There are no winners in this story. In fact, we have all lost collectively regardless of the outcome. For Chelsea and I, Brunswick, Georgia is not some distant place. When Chelsea was in Jacksonville and I was in Beaufort, South Carolina, we would regularly meet in Brunswick, Georgia. It was kind of the perfect halfway point between her and I for some of the last years that we were married but not living in the same place. It's a place that is an awful lot like Elizabeth City. Probably something similar has happened here in Elizabeth City, and it's just not been videoed. And usually my privilege allows me to not think about it. But not today. Today we grieve collectively, all of us. So I've been struggling, obviously. Chelsea got me out the door to go exercise yesterday, and thank goodness, I needed it. I also have been needing a word of gospel, which brings in this week's gospel text. I am, like so often before this, amazed by the poignancy of this week's gospel text. John 14 comes from what is known as Jesus' farewell discourse. He is saying goodbye. Jesus is giving parting instructions to his disciples before his departure. He's trying to shore up one last time that they do actually understand that he is a person of the triune God and that he is God's ultimate expression of love for humanity. He is God's love poured out for us. And also he's trying to reinforce that we're to love one another. Last, 
He is describing that he's going to his fate of the cross. He is warning that the cross is coming. But that fate of the cross is temporary. And he brings with him an eternal fate of salvation for all of us. When Jesus says in verse 1, do not let your hearts be troubled, I can't tell you how much I needed to hear that this week. Not because it's going to change or obscure the reality of our present situation, but it reminds us who is with us in that present situation. It reminds us what I would imagine we all need to hear right now. The bad stuff will happen, but God will not leave or forsake us. It reminds us that in our grief and fear, God has perfect communion waiting for us. And sometimes we get a glimpse of it here. But it is no accident that this passage is frequently chosen as a passage to be read at funerals. When saints die in the faith, few other passages say so explicitly, Do not be afraid. I have prepared a place for you in my Father's house. Hmm. Unfortunately, this passage is also used in unhelpful and destructive ways, and that deserves some attention this morning. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me has this long history of being used to tell our neighbors of other ancient faiths that they and their ancestors are all cut out, excluded from God's covenantal relationships, and will be subject to wrath in the hereafter. When Thomas asked Jesus, Master, Where are you going again? And how do we know the way? That is the context of this passage. Jesus is answering that question. Jesus is describing the nature of God the Father through himself. Jesus is the nature of God the Father. And he's describing that to Thomas, to someone who is asking about God's nature and the way to where Jesus is going. Our understanding of the Father as Christian peoples has to be through the lens of Jesus the Son. Jesus is saying, I, the personification of grace and mercy and sacrifice, I am God's nature. Boy, isn't that quite literally the opposite of the hubris that exists plastered on huge signs by street corner evangelical professional shouters like the one we had out by our mailbox about a year ago. The way to the Father is realized through Jesus. Through Jesus on the cross. There is no sweeter word There is no cooler salve. For all of us saints, there is no greater source of hope. Hope. But not pride. As Christians, the cross should bring both great joy and peace. But it should also bring with it great humility. I am confident that God has good and a benevolent plan for our Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, and Buddhist brothers and sisters. I don't know what that is. That's way above my pay grade. But I do know that God's nature is mercy, inclusion, and grace. And all of that is personified in Jesus Christ on the cross. That is the nature of the God we worship. I hope you enjoyed our opening hymn, Audio Adrenaline's Big House, 
Special thanks to the Chapel family for their musical contributions again this week. That song is probably one of the few times the word football will ever be sang in a sacred setting. But as our world struggles in the present moment, I loved and found great comfort and joy in the imagery for paradise. That it is a big house, a big full table, and a place to be together. The evil one is at work in this present moment, trying to rob us of the church experiences that feel like this song, glimpses of the kingdom of God. I know many of y'all out there need a hug, and boy, so do I. My grandfather and dad didn't teach me how to give a proper handshake so that I would holster it and not use it. I need to shake some hands. I miss cooking for people. We were going to have some amazing soups in Lent. Boy, this was the Lentiest Lents of all Lents, I've heard it said. When youth group finally finds themselves on an open field to play some frisbee or football, I need to once again check my competitive nature so that I don't... uh, send some of our smaller folks to the hospital. I'm just going to be so excited that I need to to tamp it down. (laughs) Our other two hymns in our worship playlist this Sunday, one led by our No Commitment Choir, and the other led by some of Chelsea and my dear friends from the Naval Academy Men's and Women's Glee Clubs, mostly from my class, that put Chelsea and I together a long time ago. These hymns were chosen because they are both hymns for people in times of grief. And understandably, they point to the hope that we have in Jesus. That when we cry out of our stony griefs, we will also cry nearer, my God, to Thee. When we say, I need Thy presence every passing hour that we will be able to abide in God's love. When Jesus says to his disciples and to us, do not let your hearts be troubled. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. Take him at his word. Do not be afraid. Grieve in its season, but with the caveat that everything of this world has a season. God's love, however, is infinite and forever and for everyone. So peace be with you. Shalom. Salam Aleikum. Peace be with us all. Amen.